oh i've got to edit is this live yes it's live so assalamualaikum everyone hello welcome to chai with shwebe so unfortunately i have to break against my own policy i'm drinking water mostly because it's it's 10 p.m. my time so i can't really drink tea and and wake up all night but welcome to chai with shwebe so take that metaphorically for today uh today we're going to be resuming what is otherwise a sidetrack conversation from academic access this is more of an informal chat as i mentioned it's a different flavor altogether uh last time we had subur and this time we are very lucky enough to have the one of the youngest sheikhs you'll ever meet on the planet sheikh hisham jafar hisham welcome to chai with shwaib assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi how are you doing bro alhamdulillah uh, alhamdulillah bro alhamdulillah welcome to chai with shwaib man and I'm happy to be here and uh, been enjoying all the other academic access sessions you've been doing with um, a really unique set of academics that we don't really have access to uh, or they don't have access to kind of to the public so it's been really good to see that and uh, on to be on your show and uh, I don't know how many years since you sat across the table in person definitely more than 5 years <laughs> um, so it's, it's nice it's nice to be it's nice to be uh, back in the same virtual room with you alhamdulillah 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 so um me and hisham we've actually he was actually here in uae but he moved over to the uk so he moves he, he moved over to um up north but uh if we, i'm i'm not going to spoil the details so today we're going to actually be talking about an amazing project that sheikh hisham has started right um but i want to first allow him to just explain who he is his background his bio so that you guys are aware of you know what this individual is doing where he's coming from and where he's where he is today so hisham take it forward man okay assalamu alaikum so um as a self introduction i'm hisham as you all know um i grew up in the uae as you just mentioned and as kind of we referred to earlier um i've been studying and teaching uh, the islamic sciences for the last 8 years more much more on the study side than the teaching side um also about about 7 years ago um in the uae there's a long prolonged and convoluted process to become uh, to deliver to be able to be someone who delivers khutbas or who leads prayers so um i was a licensed khatib and imam in the uae 7 years ago um and then i came to the uk and kind of continued uh, doing a little bit on the side i studied electrical engineering at the university of nottingham which is where i came in terms of secular studies um and uh, now i now am a muslim chaplain at the same university at the university of nottingham so a muslim chaplain has kind of multiple hats they have to wear one is the pastoral care of the muslim student community the other is kind of advising the university on the islamic faith on uh, how they can kind of cooperate and work with muslim students uh, requirements of muslim students etc on policy and things like that um and thirdly working with kind of people of other faiths or no faiths on campus and kind of uh, discussing religion faith in the 21st century etc and having that kind of exposure for muslims on campus uh, so that's my current role i also uh, work with an organization called roots academy which we'll probably get into more detail later um so yeah that's that's the summary excellent okay so um hisham you've been somebody who's been working on the parallel track of trying to balance you know your i don't like to use the word secular education but let's just say you know your basic you know foundational degrees and alongside that you're you're doing the islamic sciences so what encouraged you to do that um initially like why did you want to do both systems or did, did you not have that in plan that just came up organically so it's interesting i mean there was always a um an interplay between both and there was also a a period where i was torn between both uh, and i kind of explain it with the analogy of being on two skateboards one one foot on each skateboard and the two skateboards going in different directions and at some point you're doing a split um and you kind of have to pick one route over the other mm-hmm. um what happened with me was i started studying islam seriously the arabic language and memorizing the quran studying islam seriously in my uh, early to mid teens um and i started telling my parents i want to go to al azhar i want to go to medina i want to go to mecca and um i was blessed that uh, i had exposure to a lot of scholars and teachers in the uae and those who would visit the uae and i would always ask them advice and you know they had obviously as if you ask 10 people you'll get 10 opinions so um you know a lot of them would advise me yeah you know apply to medina apply to mecca apply to al azhar etc so this entire time um i was con- continuing my my normal secular education as you said you know we don't really like to call it secular but you know my gcse is my a levels etc and uh, i would come home 
in the afternoon. And um, I would basically head straight to one of the masajid. So either I'd hop on a bus to a masjid in Sharjah to study. Uh, it would be like an hour and a half, two hours by bus, or I'd uh, go to one of the nearby masjids where I'd, I had different lessons, different days of the week. In the traditional method of studying, uh, there's no real university program, but you study text after text. You memorize the text, you study the commentary, the teacher, etc. So that was kind of my routine. Um, and that continued on and it was in my final year of school in my A-levels when I was kind of really torn. And uh, I applied to the Islamic University of Medina. Um, I didn't really know how to apply to Egypt. I didn't really know what else was out there. And what actually happened is that I got rejected. Oh. So, yeah, I, I actually I actually didn't hear back. And I just assumed that this was a rejection. So I didn't hear back one year, two years, three years. And till now, my application is still open. If there's anybody there hearing this, maybe they can uh, they can action. But, you know, growing up in the UAE, I knew about the administ uh, administrative skills of the Middle Eastern, uh, you know, culture. So I took that as, you know, it's a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, continue with the path, continue with studying, continue with my, my secular education and continue the, the, the track on the side. And one thing I feel like is certainly I'm very grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he allowed this for me. And the reason is that one of the routes into becoming like a most, the, my motivation for studying in the first place actually came from science. Mm -hmm. came from what I was studying in physics and biology. And physics is, is my favorite science, uh, closely followed by, by philosophy. Um, and kind of the sciences is, is what led me to God, what led me to Allah, and, and, and trying to question why we are here and what, what's the reason behind all of this. So uh, I feel like it's allowed me to see with both eyes. Mm. You know, you have Allah has two forms of science. He has Al-Ayatul Kawniya, the the signs in the world around us and he's got the scriptural signs the ayat al qurani you know revealed signs and um, i feel very privileged that i can read both scriptures i can read the cosmos and, and i can read the quran um whereas many can read one and not the other so i feel like it's been a very um i've been very grateful very blessed to have had that experience hmm. right. it requires really? a lot of okay. traveling I'm... yeah but... yeah yeah i can imagine no, go ahead great if you want to say sorry i, I, no, I was just going to say it, it does require a lot of juggling um, yeah. and uh, a lot of sacrifices um, you know I, I work a nine-to-five job and I squeeze my chaplaincy roots academy all of this in the evenings and weekends so and early mornings uh, as well as studying so it's it's always something that has been that has pushed me to make more use of my time so while my friends were watching Netflix and movies I was uh, you know grafting it out in, in a corner of the masjid um, but alhamdulillah that's kind of become a norm for me um, so I'm very really grateful to have that Alhamdulillah, very good, very good. So, uh, and then as you, you know, went through this experience, you developed an institution, right? Roots Academy. That's so right. can you tell us what this academy is about? So while you say this, I'm just going to pop this up so that people can start seeing this. Oh, hang on, I need to share my screen. Uh, share screen. Mm -hmm. uh, application, oh, Chrome tab, there we go. There you go. So we should be able to see it now. There we are. This is Roots Academy. Yeah, right. so that's a website. Yes. Yeah. So can you tell us about, about this institution that you've created? So yeah, so Roots Academy was born out of my teaching experiences. So for the last eight years, as you know, Shay, we taught at the same supplementary school in the UAE, in Al Manar. And um, kind of I started out eight years ago teaching nine year olds, and then it went to 11 year olds, and then 13, and then 15 year olds. And then I came to the UK and I didn't leave the classroom. So I was still teaching on evenings on a weekly basis, but this time university students. And uh, there was a bit of a shock to my system when I realized that the majority of Muslims in the UK become practicing at an older age. So they kind of rediscover their faith at an older age, mm. at which time they realize that their actual fundamental knowledge of the basics is severely lacking or there's gaps. So I was dealing with a cohort of, say, university students. And for the last five to six years, I've been teaching university students on evenings and weekends, dealing with them on a close one to one basis. And I realize here, 18 to 23, 24 year olds who have the Islamic knowledge of a primary school student in a Muslim country. Mm. And that that uh, and, and what is there to replace that, that requirement or that desire to learn about the deen is usually either. And we've done polls about this. We've polled about 400 students uh, from a wider age range, not just university students. Yeah. Um, kind of on one side, you have infotainment. So you have like clips of YouTube speakers, bite-sized clips with nasheeds in the background that give you a spiritual stimulus for about 15 minutes and then that disappears. Mm 
On the other hand, you have masjids and kind of traditional institutions, which don't offer uh, you know structured programs for adults, and also sometimes mm -hmm. adults don't have the time. Kind of the schedule doesn't fit with what the masjid is teaching. I'll give you an example. Like our local masjid teaches the forty hadith of Imam al-Nawawi. Mm -hmm. They do one hadith a week. So and if you attended diligently for an entire year, you would learn 40 hadith. And for me, there is a loss there in the sense that there's a much wider spectrum of things that you need to learn, that a Muslim needs to learn. Mm -hmm. The other the other challenge that I've seen or the, the gap that I've seen was one of pedagogy is how, how these things are taught. So Root's slogan is cultivating faith because, it's, it, you know, our approach is that it's not just about consuming information, but things are to be taught in a way that they nurture a person's relationship with God, nurture one's relationship with Allah. So when one is teaching the, you know, say fiqh, how to pray or how to purify yourself, there's a spiritual aspect of purification, a spiritual aspect of prayer, you know, and that's not taught. That's not, that's one of the intangible things that is, you know, usually taught in a teacher-student relationship, but you don't get. So Roots Academy at the moment we are developing a one-year study program called The Essentials. So if you click on The Essentials, you'll be able to see it uh, in the top tab yep, there. Yep. One second, let me do that, yeah. So what is The Essentials? Uh, we're saying there it is, you're going to see now like uh, six courses pop up side by side, five courses really, but the previous version was six courses. Each of these courses is about six to eight weeks in length. And each of these courses uh, only requires a time commitment of 45 minutes a week. Mm -hmm. Right, only about forty-five minutes a week for six weeks. Uh, the courses are self-paced and live, so they are. So, for example, the Sira course, which we launched in September, um, it was completely self-paced. So, you're a working person, you're a university student, you're a GP, you're a surgeon, you're a mother of six. You don't get time to attend a seven p.m. live lesson. That's fine. Um, the courses are self-paced, so you watch maybe you know 30, 40 minutes a week. Maybe one week you're less busy, you watch maybe an hour. Uh, the other thing about the, the course is that the videos are bite-sized. So each each lesson is only 15 minutes long, 15 to 20 minutes long. And then the way the, the lessons are recorded, they're, they're recorded uh, in high definition in a studio. So uh, kind of the video quality is very high. The curriculum is well planned out. Each lesson ends with a reflection point and an action point. So this part of that idea is that this idea of this curriculum isn't just something for you to consume as knowledge, as information. It's supposed to transform you. Like the, the end product of you after nine months, me after nine months learning on this program, is that we develop as individuals. So for example, in the Sira, when we, you know, when we look at the first lesson, which is about the Prophet Muhammad before prophethood, mm -hmm. one of the things we focus on is that the Prophet, peace be upon him, spent a lot of time alone and in reflection and contemplation. A lot of time as a shepherd in the cave of Hira, and the reflection point we draw from that is that today in this chaotic world of distraction and stimulus and mobile phones, you know, how often do we spend with ourselves just alone, introspecting, reflecting, thinking? How, how much do we have to distract ourselves from ourselves? And then the action point from that is for you to take, pick one, one day this week and put your phone on airplane mode for half a day and go to, you know, a natural place and just reflect on the creation of Allah. So that's how the curriculum, it's not your usual kind of, let's read a Sira book. Let's take a classical text and teach it. It's a repackaging of classical material to achieve contemporary challenges, to address contemporary challenges. In the Adab course that you see in front of you, which is about character and conduct, we don't just address Silatul Rahim, which is family relations. We also address, for example, things like abusive relationships. We don't just address, for example, things like uh, the sins of the tongue, which is a classical topic in adab, in tazkiyah, you know, the sins of the tongue. We also address the fiqh of social media, you know, how to deal with keyboard warriors and people blocking you and poking you and WhatsApp usage, et cetera, et cetera. What is the adab of screen time? Uh, what is the adab of, uh, you know, for example, finding a spouse, you know, in an age where it's no longer where everyone finds their spouse from their family network or their village network or their community network. People are finding their spouses on mobile apps, on Instagram. So what, what are the guidelines surrounding that? What about gender interaction? We live in a very co-educated space, whether it's university or work. Uh, men and women are in the same physical space, especially in the West. So what are the guidelines surrounding that? So we try to make the, it's a classical curriculum repackaged to meet contemporary challenges. And it's bite-sized, it's self-paced, Every lesson ends with a, a quiz, so three multiple choice questions, and then a prompt for your reflection. You can write like a paragraph. We ask you a question to actually reflect on, and you can, you can fill it in. And those bits are optional. 
So it's a very contemporary take on how things are taught as well as what is taught. So both in substance as well as in in form and style of delivery, et cetera, et cetera. So that's hopefully that's going to launch in September, October. What we've been doing so far this year is trialing out the content and the courses with a cohort of university students and, and not just university students. So a quarter of them are 40 plus in age. Half of the, the student cohort are university students or in the 18 to 25 age bracket. And another quarter are you know younger or older than 40. So we've been, uh, so our first course, Sira course, was taken by about six or 700 students. We're currently teaching Yaqeen, which is Islam's intellectual foundations. Again, it's a contemporary take on Aqeedah. So rather than, so in an Aqeedah course, for example, I've always had this gripe, how is Aqeedah studied Muslim beliefs? Muslim beliefs are studied in classical texts based on uh, classical disagreements in Aqeedah. So the idea of Khalqul Quran is the Quran created or uncreated. The idea of um, al iman, the definition of iman. Does iman include? Is it qawlun wa amal? Is it statement and action, or is it just statement? Now, a lot of these masail, a lot of these questions are arising from historic disagreements. For example, the question about iman arises from the the dispute between the Khawarij and the Muslims in the in one of the earliest disputes, creedal disputes that happens. This idea about qadr, about free will and determinism, arises from the dispute between the Qadariyya and the Jabariyya. Um, you know, in the, again, this was even faced by the Sahaba. However, you know, a new someone kind of 25 years old, 23 years old, 35 years old, the only Islamic education, and we've polled students, about 70% of students, the only Islamic education they've had is their madrasa maktab education pre-14 years old in order to learn how to read the Quran. That's the only, that's the last time they had a structured education. So that really is a disaster. It really is a, you know, it's a tragedy. And so how for many example- How students did you poll in total? Like to, to, to be able to make that assessment? That was about 200 students. Wow. Okay. And, and I think, and and we we do accept like this is a small sample size. It's a niche group, but this is also like from anecdotal experience in the UK. And I've spoken to other like educational leaders like Sheikh Shams Duha, who you know well from Ibrahim College, and others who uh, Sheikh Abu Abdullah Yunus uh, in London, and, and other Sheikh Saji, Sheikh Haitham Al Haddad, and consulting the this this um, kind of previous generation of scholars who are still kind of our seniors, they kind of I agree with this general idea that a lot of people growing up in the UK, growing up in the West, the Islamic education is quite limited to supplementary school, quite limited to one day a week. And it kind of stops, structured education stops at a certain age, after which it becomes ad hoc. Mm -hmm. So you're going to university, you're studying biology 101, biology 102, macro microbiology, micro macroeconomics, and it's all systematic. And it's all detailed and with depth and it, it's thought provoking. And you actually start to enjoy it. Whereas your religious education is a uh, once in two week halaqa where somebody decides to bring up a story of the prophets not that story of the prophets is not a good topic but look at the the imbalance look at the imbalance between how we educate ourselves in a secular manner systematic rigorous with depth with experts when it comes to our religious education we kind of just settle for a casual chips and nachos and a bit of chill time in a halaqa. Now we know that you know, community is very important and a lot of the time these gatherings are for the sake of community. But um, our understanding of existence is based upon our based upon Islamic knowledge really. That is how we, that's the framework with which we understand the universe. So like the Yaqeen course right now, and the thing is we're not advertising any of our courses publicly at the moment in this kind of beta testing phase. We're advertising with a private network of ex-students as well as Islamic societies. So for example, the Yaqeen course, our target was to just have 100 students for this test, you know, testing the content, 400 students registered. And this keeps happening. We keep realizing that the demand is greater than the supply. So for example, this Yaqeen course, how are we going to teach Aqeedah as, as another example of how we're trying to tweak the substance of the education. Classical Aqeedah is taught by kind of in order of historic disputes between sects. How are we teaching Aqidah? We're teaching it from first principles. So starting with God, with Allah, you know, his existence. How do we know him? Why do we worship him? Do we know him? Like, do we actually know him? You know, uh, one of the, in the interactive way that we teach, even on Zoom, we teach with multiple choice questions and kind of student interaction. We ask students things like, you know, do you know what's the meaning of As-Samad? Qul huwallahu ahad Allahu samad One of the shortest surahs we all know. And 99% of people don't know what it means. So we have this relationship with Allah, which is based on, it's a very fitri, it's a very instinctive thing, but we don't know who he is and we don't know how to know him. 
you know, but we can kind of describe our local football player or our local celebrity or even our sheikh at the masjid in so much detail, but we don't know the creator who created us. So this is kind of the first lesson. The course even goes on to explore questions of the kind of the veracity of hadith. So how do we know if the Prophet Muhammad says something? How do we know it's true? How do you know the Quran was preserved? If we learn something from science or something from philosophy, can can Islam contradict science or how does it what's the interplay between the mind, reason and revelation? How how does that interplay take place? How can we trust revelation? Why do we believe in the unseen? So we rather than posing these questions in a sort of in a in a criticism in a way of kind of uh, creating doubts in people we move from first principles in a way that nurtures conviction mm -hmm. so we ask the question and we answer the question from revelation and one thing we try not to do is make it over philosophical so for example when i'm talking about god's existence or allah's existence right one of the central arguments that we use is the fitra the idea that this is something in a human being's factory settings now, what, if you go to um, you know William Lane Craig or popular theist philosophers, or even you go to Speaker's Corner, it's all about philosophical argumentation. This premise is that premise is this conclusion. Um, and having read most of the books of Anser, Anselm, Dawkins, you know, on the theist and atheist spectrum, I personally have a conviction that philosophy doesn't nurture conviction, doesn't nurture yaqeen. There's always another rational argument that's going to supersede or consume, or, you know, uh, at least you might find at odds with something that you haven't, you know, rational arguments don't produce conviction. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do is we try to peg it on revelation. So how does God talk to us about his existence? He asks the fundamental question, you know, where did you come from? You know, he asks us to ponder the cosmos. Uh, he, he, you know, uh, indeed in the creation of the night and day, in the creation of heavens and the earth, and the alternation of night and day. And, you know, how did this verse affect the prophet? And, you know, what you know, simple human understanding, just using reason, can we take away from this to lead us to a conclusion that a God must necessarily exist? Mm -hmm. So like when you're trying to, when we're trying to, we're trying to develop this curriculum for the masses. It's not something that's for a niche intellectual group. So even when we teach these things, and we want to teach it for a con answering contemporary questions, we want to teach it in such a way that it, it approaches a broad audience, that is pegged on revelation, and that is very systematic. So kind of students come out of the course, not necessarily knowing about Khalq al-Quran or Khawarij or Masail al-Iman, but these, what we call the six articles of faith, they have a con confidence and a conviction in these six articles, and perhaps they can even articulate it to those around them. And mm -hmm. in the West, that question of articulation becomes more important when you're working with non-Muslims, when you're studying with non-Muslims, or maybe your family have people who are not practicing or have lost faith. So the ability to articulate in a way that is understandable by another Western Muslim or non-Muslim, mm -hmm. that ability to articulate theology becomes important. So we even, as part of our course, we give supplementary readings. We ask people to write you know, action points. We give them reflection prompts to kind of write out their thoughts on theology. Um, and all of this is done. So this, this Yaqeen course is a five week course, five one hour lessons. And we try to cover that material in a very bite-sized way. So it's a live course at the moment when it becomes, when it becomes self-paced, it's gonna be 20, 15 minute lessons. So, so it's going to be on, very Michelle, Is this yeah. the same one that you sent me to look at? Yeah, so that's the skeleton I shared with you. Okay, okay, all right. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering if, if, because you said five lessons, like, I don't remember. So at that. the moment, yeah. So, so when we test content, so before we release to the public, because I work in software and I work in IT, um, I always, I, I do like this idea of, you know, test it with a closed group, understand, make sure the content works, understand their reactions. So we're testing the content in live lessons, condensed, a condensed, condensed version of the content. So it's five one-hour live lessons. And then, inshallah, it's going to be, you know, a 20 lesson full fledged course with all the quizzes. Okay, and okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So the idea is that a student would start with us in October and they would finish in maybe July or August in the following year. And in that time, they would have done five modules, five uh, modules, each of which would only be a 30 to 45 minute commitment per week, which is very reasonable for working professionals, for university students, for et cetera, et cetera. So that's the vision behind the curriculum. That's the gap we're trying to fill. And and how we're trying to do it differently to you know according to the problems we've seen on the ground, right? Okay, okay, excellent. So it seems like you're doing um, the there's a particular I mean audience you're catering for to kind of help them tie up their their religious knowledge in light of their you know in circumstances and commitments that they already have, right? That's right. So 
Now, the thing is, um, you've you've been running these courses so far, and you did mention that you know the demand is more than the supply. So, yeah. <clears throat> are you planning to scale this up? So you said that it's a closed network. When can people start uh, applying for them just volitionally, like without being privately invited? So right now, even if you if you clicked on the Sira course, you'll be able to access it. But we've not advertised it, right? Mm. Um, where, so if people, for example, kind of, um, if you click on that enroll now button, for example, yeah, let's hope our website team doesn't fail us, inshallah, yep. and then you know leads you to the Sira page. So our website is a little bit slow. But we're working. So that's the CIRA course. And anybody can enroll. So anybody listening to this can go on the website, enroll on the CIRA course. So that's our course objectives. And if you scroll down further, you'll be able to see all of the 20 lessons, the titles, our references. Each lesson has, you know, there's also uh, a course workbook that you can work through. So, um, yeah. So that's the entire life of the Prophet Salam in 20 short lessons, which I don't believe has been done on the internet. I don't believe it has been done before. Um, so hopefully, you know, coming September, October, this will be launched as a one-year program for people to sign up for the entire year. At the moment, people can participate. Like you could sign up for this course right now and you could take it. Um, we have a Telegram channel, a Roots Academy Telegram channel, um, or if you follow us on social media. But particularly if you follow our Telegram channel, you you know, students will get access to courses that we are privately testing. But, um, you know, it's only a few months' time. The idea is that these five courses will come with five printed workbooks. So you have like a physical workbook that you're kind of filling in, you're writing in along this journey that you're, you know, of self-development and transformation, you're going, in, you know, in this 10-month period. So that's the that's the plan. So in September, October, the, the public release of the entire program as a one-year program. At the moment, they're being tested on an individual course basis. So in Ramadan, inshallah, in, you know, just about four weeks away, we're going to, you know, publicly relaunch our Quran 2020 course that we did last year, the tafsir of 20 short surahs in 20 days. So for those who are busy, who can't do a one hour lecture a day, 15 minutes a day. Uh, so that's going to be launched out in Ramadan. So you know, that's going to be publicly launched. So anybody who's interested, you know, keep your eyes out in the next two to three weeks, inshallah, for the public launch of that. Okay, brilliant. And so um, in terms of the language, uh, is this done primarily in English or do you also teach Arabic on the side just to get people familiarized with the terms? Like, how does that work? Yeah, so the, the, the program is taught entirely in English. It's taught for an English-speaking audience. There are uh, kind of thoughts and uh, ideas about, you know, once this Essentials program is launched, these five courses, this one-year program, uh, kind of for adults to re-educate themselves on their faith, what's the next step? Is there a level two? Is there a second year? You know, is there an Arabic program? Um, the possibilities are endless. And uh, I don't, you know, personally for myself, Arabic studies is something that I've always had a very keen interest in and also Arabic teaching. So it may very well be, uh, you know, perhaps another step. But at the moment, uh, everything's taught in English. Of course, the sources themselves are in Arabic. The, the classical works that we rely on are in Arabic. But the workbooks, the education, the notebooks, everything is in English, uh, you know, tuned to an English-speaking audience. Okay. And is there, um, like, accessibility? So, for example, if students have issues or, um, let's just say you have a university student, right? So. Yeah. Your, your, your average Muhammad walking down the classroom, somebody asks him, you know, um, you're Muslim. He goes, I guess, how do you know God exists? And so if they have, a, if they have issues with being able to discuss a certain point, can they, can they you know, discuss this with the teacher or yeah. is it closed access? How does it work? No, most definitely. So at the moment, for example, as we are in a kind of privately better testing our course content, students have open access to me as the instructor for the course. Okay. Uh, they can message me privately on Telegram or we have we usually have discussion groups for every course. So students can discuss, ask questions, debate, raise objection as they wish. At the end of every live lesson also, we usually have like an open Q&A. And the questions I don't end up answering live, I end up you know writing a detailed answer and sending out as a document. So um, when it comes to, you know, inshallah, future courses, there's always going to be a discussion element, this idea that students can access the teacher, because we believe that is a core part of learning, yeah. is being able to discuss, being, you know, having access to the instructor, having, being able to have discussion, you know, open conversations with the instructor. So that's definitely something that's uh, high on the priority list. And we also have, alhamdulillah, like a, an academic team. So there's a team of uh, four brothers who are uh, graduates in Sharia and master's degrees in Islamic studies who are also assisting and developing the curriculum as well as assisting in, in answering questions. So it's not just me. There's like 
it, the whole thing is it, there's a team of about 20 brothers involved in this um and not just brothers 20 brothers and sisters involved in this so it's um even on the academic side with questions there's a team of people to respond to help to you know so there's a panel it. you're saying there's a panel behind it. there's definitely a panel behind this yeah all right. Okay. Excellent. And in terms of, you know, you, you, I mean, you alluded to this point, but you have a long-term vision. Potentially, this can work into level two, level three, level four. So, yeah. in terms of planning, are you? Uh, because one of the biggest challenges, at least in my point of view, is mm -hmm. you have two things. One, on the social level, we are very distracted. So the yeah. idea of the sawaf or tasket and nafs focusing on the heart becomes exceedingly challenging. Exceedingly, particularly in a capitalistic society, very yeah. challenging. So that's yeah. one big issue that I find. The other issue is generally the uh, uh, rigorous theology in the sense that um, a lot of people cannot, of course, I mean, you have your bite-sized clips, you have your Dawa clips online that you can fall back onto. Yeah, but in yeah. terms of being able to rigorously answer the relationship between science and religion, atheism and all of that, I think those two are like some of the biggest issues that a lot of lay Muslims have problems with. So yeah. are there plans in the pipeline to maybe have more advanced courses that you know deal with these particular concerns? Yeah, it's it's something it's only something that we've discussed before. We're kind of um because I keep pushing this this all these things I've learned from the software world uh, which is kind of, you know, launch something, measure the data from it, build, test, build, test, build, test, learn, build, test. So, you know, release one thing, learn from it and then kind of think about okay, what can I do next? What how can I extend this more? Right. So uh, at the moment, we're entirely focused on that initial, initial kind of proof of concept that we want to launch to the public, and then learn from it and learn from the reactions and how it runs for the first year. Um, one thing, like from all the subjects that we're teaching, if there's anything that I, I think, um, of course, all of these subjects can have like require advanced learning. So tasawwuf, tazkiyah, um, whether it's the Quran. You know, we're only teaching 20 surahs of the 20 short surahs. It could always go to more Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Mulk, Surah Yaseen. But particularly, and I think this is something that a lot of people are divorced from reality in this respect. As a, a Muslim chaplain at university, I can firmly say that we are losing a generation. We're losing Intellectually, we are losing a generation. To doubt so can you expand on questions. that? What do you mean losing a generation? We're losing a generation. Like, uh, like in the last year, I've seen three Muslims leave their faith. Oh, okay. That for that's example, okay, that's okay, in okay. that sense, and 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 the the stem. Now, I'm not saying that it's always intellectual or philosophical the causes of leaving faith, but there is a, an element of I have questions about my religion, and I nobody's there to answer them. I don't know why God exists. They come to a position where they're like, why does evil exist? And so, if there's anything, uh, if if anything will hopefully help maintain that conviction. If it requires advanced courses, I certainly think it's something that there's a need for. Now, there's there's other organizations that are doing, and I would say they're specialists in this. So, Seth Hamza George's is Sapiens Institute, for example. I would say they are specialists in this regard, in terms of theological, advanced theological learning, education, writing, publication. Yaqeen Institute is another good example. Yourselves, Fatima Elizabeth Cates Academy, as another example. So, what we don't want to do is begin duplicating the work of others. In right. a mediocre, in a mediocre way, what we'd maybe rather do is point people. Perhaps that's one one strategy is to point people to the better resources. So Sapiens Academy, Fatima Elizabeth Cates, Yaqeen Institute, they've got an advanced course on, you know, God's existence or on theology. So here, go there, pursue. You want to learn, you know, tafsir further. Okay, there you've got Baina Institute, further learning over there. So that's one model, which is that we kind of give the initial building blocks and then we refer people on to where they can further learn. Mm -hmm. Another model is that we keep kind of building this into a full program, an integrated curriculum that, that spans two or three or four years. So I don't know at the moment which way we're going to go, um, but both of those are options, yeah. Okay, brilliant. And um, with regards to the, the, pe the people who have gone through your programs, have you received any testimonials so far? Yep, so alhamdulillah, so we've we've delivered three courses so far. The tafsir of 20 surahs, the seerah, and yaqeen now. We're in the middle of delivering yaqeen. So in these three courses, uh, we've received uh, approximately 60 to 70 testimonials from students who've completed the courses and who've left behind good messages. You know, just the other day, um, it, it's really touching sometimes. Just the other day, I received a message from a convert who's based in Singapore, who's been attending our lessons live at 1 a.m. And uh, that kind of dedication and that kind of, you know, their messages coming in saying like, you know, uh, we never really felt we had a conviction. why We never knew why we believe what we believe, but now we do. 
Mm. And it's, you know, it's eye opening. Sometimes, you know, in the middle of the live lesson, I say, guys, am I putting everybody to sleep? And somebody replies like, it's 3 a.m. here in Maldives, but I'm still awake. So those kind of testimonials, you know, there's, and there's a lot, alhamdulillah, and we're trying to collate a bank of them, um, you know, when we, inshallah, hopefully, fully publicly launch the entire year's program. Inshallah, great. And uh, just one more question that I have here is, um, are you, is, is this particular, are these courses limited to the Western world or is it open to anyone? I, I definitely think not the case. It's, it's, it's open globally. The idea is that, you know, I grew up in the Muslim country in the UAE. Uh, many people try to migrate to Muslim countries today from Western countries uh, with the intention of uh, kind of giving the kids a better Islamic education. They go over to those Muslim countries and they realize that there's quite a lot of parallel between the Western world and between the Muslim world. Um, certainly the environment that I grew up in and I went to an Islamic school, there were certainly quite a lot of the things that I think that are available in public schools here. So um, it's something, you know, English is the world's lingua franca. Um, these challenges of atheism and questions about science and religion or a uh, disconnect with spirituality or you know all of these challenges that we see in the muslim world are existent throughout the world wherever there's an, a young english-speaking muslim without a proper curriculum without a proper program they will have that gap so it's not something that we're deliberately restricting in any way and that's why we're being very diligent with every course every word every workbook every quiz has to be checked double checked triple checked by the academic team by senior scholars signed off um, as it's something that's going to go out to the public. Hmm. Okay, right, brilliant. And um, there's another question that just, just came up. Is um, you know you're talking about these weekly, you know, lectures and these action points and reminder points. Um, do they have like follow-ups, like homework type of situations, or does that not exist? You're since you're very action focused. So um, we give for every course. There's a printed student workbook. So it, you know, hopefully, inshallah, it'll be kind of a pack of five workbooks that comes in the post the day you sign up for the essentials. Um, they're very beautifully designed. And so what happens is that kind of these reflections and these action points, you can kind of, they'll be like trackers for you to track your own action and your own development. Mm -hmm. And in terms of reflection points, what we try to do is get people to engage with what they're learning, not just passively consume. So for example, when we teach Surah Al-Fatiha, the reflection prompt we give is, Allah introduces himself in the first three verses of Surah Al-Fatiha. Today, if a non-Muslim were to come to you and ask you, who is Allah? How would you introduce him? And there's a blank space for you to write. Or if you're on the e-learning portal, there's a text box for you to write in your answer. And that's just for you. So there is that kind of, you can call it homework. It's completely optional. And there's a little quiz, three question quiz. It should only take, the whole thing should just take you five minutes. Um, but we do kind of encourage students to do those extra activities. We do understand some have, you know, difficult schedules and routines. Some of them, you know, do it all on the weekend. They batch, do all of their reflection points and quizzes on the weekends. That's perfectly fine. Um, action, one thing about action is, and really this comes back to the true nature of tarbiyah. Um, human, practical human development cannot be monitored in a classroom, cannot be captured in homework or in a workbook. It can only be encapsulated by prolonged uh, companionship with people of knowledge whether that's in a classroom, whether that's in a, in a masjid setting, this whole idea of this journey of, you know, spiritual development, character development that you go on with a teacher. And we know that we can't provide that, but we can try and instigate people to actually at least think about their character, think about, for example, last week, the lesson on the intellectual, on the Yaqeen course was about uh, the proofs of prophethood. How, why do we have messengers? How do we know Muhammad peace upon him was a messenger? One of the core proofs of prophethood is his character. So you have testimonies from contemporary Western non-Muslim philosophers, historians about the remarkable character of this man and how he could have only been a prophet. The action point we take from that, we tell people is, think about three things of your character that you could improve in your work or your home life. And remember that people in your work and home life, they see you as the messenger. They see you as Islam. They, they're not necessarily connected with the Prophet ﷺ or mm -hmm. people on the news, but they know Ahmed from my workplace or Farhan from IT or Hisham from engineering. So they look at you and you're the most, so how can we, as the Prophet peace be upon him, he had a credibility he built over 40 years. He was the truthful, the trustworthy. So how could you build that credibility? Now, we have no way of monitoring that, but we've planted the seed of action in their mind. Mm. And inshallah, mm. you know, one kind of distant idea is that this five course curriculum, these workbooks, it becomes something that masjids take on as curriculum, that institutions take on as an adult 
learning curriculum, an adult madrasa, uh, you know, to teach it at the at the intellectual level of adults. And that's when this tarbiya can actually take place in a more holistic fashion. Uh, we are very impaired and paralyzed on the online medium. Mm. Um, so that's the, you know, eventually, if inshallah, this becomes an open curriculum for masjids to take on, for institutions to take on a contemporary curriculum for adults, then there would be hopefully something where instructors can really understand that these action points are things that we need to spend more time with our students in order to inculcate that understanding, in order to inspire, in order to make them reflect and really bring that about in their life. The idea is nine months later, 10 months later, a student just doesn't feel like I've done five courses. They feel like I've changed my life. My home life has changed. My marital life has changed. My work life has changed. So that's the, that, and really that is the education. That is the, the idea of tarbiya that you know learning isn't just information consumption but it's personal development so um, yeah that's the the hope and the aim inshallah inshallah brilliant and so um if people wanted to get in touch with you as in you personally how yeah. could they do that they can email me uh, they can message me on Facebook. I, I think you've tagged me in this post. They can yep. email me at Hisham Abu Yusuf at gmail.com. So, 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 so. Hisham at Hisham Abu Yusuf A B U Y U S U F at gmail.com. Yep. Y U S U F at gmail.com. Or they can email info at rootsacademy.co.uk. And um, just Hisham Abu Yusuf. Yeah, okay. So, one second. Let, Let me, me type just... it for you. And I, I've, let me share. Is that, is that correct? Uh, A B U. Oh right. Okay. I just made yeah, one yeah. typo. Okay. Yeah, it's a small typo. Okay. Or they can uh, reach out to Roots Academy at info at rootsacademy dot co dot uk as well. It is A B. Oh no, hang on. It's A B U. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hisham. That should be correct. There we go. So that's your your address, right? Hisham. That is my email address. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Yep, go ahead and or or they could email info at rootsacademy.co.uk. I've put that in the, the private chat here for you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. I'll post that in as well so that people can see that. Right. So that's the other one, guys, in case you want to reach out. So this is the other email address that you can reach out to if you want to get in touch with Hisham and the content, the great stuff that they're doing. So um, for those who um, who don't who want to kind of just check out the website. Um, I'm going to post that link here as well. But if you're watching this on YouTube or on Facebook, um, you should be able to see it down below on YouTube or up above on Facebook, and you'll be able to click and, and, and access their, their great material. Hashem, Hashem, thank you so much for joining us on Jawa with Shwaib. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of people will benefit from the material that you're doing. I personally think that's a great feature that you've kind of developed, and you're cultivating a group, a cohort of students. And the seed is the most important, because if you plant the seed, you get the fruits later on, inshallah. Not in just this life, but in the next slide as well inshallah. hopefully when the, when the roots when the roots grow grow deep inshallah the tree will bear its fruits pun intended In, inshallah <laughs> inshallah thank you so much everybody for tuning in and barak lafik sheikh hasham for um, giving us your time and going walking us through your journey inshallah i hope that other people can benefit from this until we see you next time we hope to have you again if you're you know if you're free enough for us inshallah but barak thank you so much wa alaikum assalam wa